Good afternoon, everyone. Apologies uh, for the late start this afternoon. Um, my name is Kenneth Joquin, and I am the Registrar of Companies. I am here today to introduce the fourth webinar for the Registrar of Companies new online registry system. We started the design and build of the new registry system two years ago with our partners at Foster Moore, who are global experts in the building of government electronic, electronic registry systems. To date, we've held three webinars covering various aspects of the system. Today's webinar will co cover amalgamations, registry, registering a segregated account company, registering a charge against a foreign entity, additional maintenance services, such as change of name, share capital changes, et cetera. Today's webinar will be led by Mr. George Outerbridge, our supervisor of registration, who was instrumental together with Ms. Maria Budrum, our assistant registrar of registration, in the design and build of the system. The teams from the Registrar of Companies and Foster Moore will be on hand today to answer any questions that you may have. Um, on another note, before we begin, um, I just want to let everyone know, we are conscious of some of the user challenges uh, that are being experienced with the system. Um, we are mindful of those challenges and um, uh, Mr. Otterbridge will be addressing some of those concerns um, as we go through those webinar, as we go through the webinar. Um, as you can appreciate, uh, this e-registration system is a complex system covering various modules and all of Bermuda's um, corporate legislation. And so while we do hope for perfection, we do appreciate that there, there are some challenges and, and technical changes that will need to be amended on the fly. And as I mentioned, uh, Mr. Otterbridge will be addressing some of those concerns as we go through this process. Um, with that said, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to attend this webinar. And George, over to you. Thank you, Ken. First of all, welcome everybody to this fourth webinar. Um, very excited to be to have gone live with the system on Monday. Um, <clears throat> we've been very busy up here trying to make sure that we keep that we keep up with everybody's applications coming in. Um, a few housekeeping, a few housekeeping things. We have the questions and answers. We are, going to, we are going to be changing up the format a little bit for today. Previously, we would add, do all of the questions and answers at the end. Now we're going, this time we're going to, we're still going to have some questions and answers at the end, but we're going to try to address some of those as, as we complete the demonstration for certain services. Um, <clears throat> as Mr. Jokin indicated, we have we we have identified some um, some challenges with our go with go live. The first one I wanted to address is the um, update profile services. So, as indicated previously, the update profile service needs to be completed prior to making any filing any filings against the against an entity, including the economic substance declarations, um, and also to receive any searches or compliance requests. Um, after feedback from the industry, we have decided to um, allow people to make submissions to do searches as, as, as um, outside of the system. So basically you'll be doing it the, the old way. This is for any companies that in the example of you do not have you. You are not the authorized person, so you have no control over the um, over the update profile service. But I still want to stress um, the update profile service is there to ensure that we have the most accurate and up to date data. So I still want to stress that we 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 need the update profile services to be completed for every entity, and I would I would I would address for all CSPs or any entities to ensure that those things are completed. <clears throat> another another thing that has come up is concerning the mortgage charges, whereas you actually have to enter in the amount. So um, through other feedback that we've received, the amount can be variable. So the that field is mainly to capture um, the amount to allocate the fee. So for, for instance, for those, for those um, applications where the, where the amount that you are owing may not, be, may not be fixed, we will allow people to enter those with, um, to put in basically a million plus or 
a million and one to get the over a million fee or the or enter in 999,000 at this time. Um, we're looking at getting that and getting that um, more, getting that field to allow a better description. <clears throat> um, another thing that's come up is the appointment date for directors, which is locked on the system. That was that that was as a result of uh, data migration, as as I stated previously. When we when we are when we were migrating over the data, it was captured in different formats. Um, it was captured in a format that was not conductive to the format of our new system. So during migration, we had to um, we had to insert an appointment date for those directors, and that was set to the incorporation date. Which it's which it uh, which it does is not necessarily the correct date. We are currently working with our developers to to, to fix that. And also the um, concerning companies registering of companies, the object field is lo is is locked to a set amount of characters. So there have been instances where the object where they cannot fit all of the objects into that field. In order to get around that for the time being, until we until we um, create until we either, until we address that directly through the system, if you are if you are not um, if you are trying to incorporate a company that has objects that are too large to fit in that field, you can do, you can contact the registration agent directly. That will be dealing with that as per the as per the current portfolio listing, and actually forward them a PDF with a schedule of the objects. And in that field, in the objects, you can just put as per as per the attached schedule, and we will attach that to the memorandum of association that is created in the filing history. <clears throat> Okay, and also we are looking. We 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 know that the as as I said, this is go live with our system. Um, our system has over a hundred and eighty services in it, and by services I mean different types of filings for different types of entities. Um, of course, like I said, we strive for perfection, but I understand that we can't we can't hit all of those out the get out the gate. So we are actually looking at setting up an additional focus group to with with the with industry members to go through any other additional challenges that might be coming up with the system so that we can address those in the most efficient manner and get those rectified as soon as possible. Okay, without further ado, let us go right into the let us go right into our demonstration for today. So I am going to start with amalgamations. <clears throat> now, as last time, um, I did last time it, I did mergers in the in the previous webinar. Amalgamations are very similar as per the requirements. So as indicated before, you must be a registered logged in user and you must have authority over the entities in order to make in order to make filings for them. So to locate any entity, to locate an entity, you can go under services, search, search entities. And from that entity, let me start at the beginning, let me start at the top. So from here, you will see there's this, that there's different fields you can go to. You can select, go to manage entity directly. And that takes you to all of the, um, all of the app, all of the services that are available to be performed on that entity. And as you scroll down, you'll see all of the different fields. So from here, you can select register amalgamation of companies in Bermuda, amalgamation of companies with for, amalgamation with a foreign corporation, 
amalgamation and continuation as a foreign corporation. That is when a company in Bermuda amalgamates with a company overseas and ends up overseas. And then of course the merges, the additional merger services. So today we're gonna to go with amalgamation of companies in Bermuda. So on here, first you have to click that, that that's this field must be clicked in saying by submitting this application, the above name company confirms it is to be registered as an amalgamated company. Um, just to go back a step, the entity that you are going in as is the entity that will, that will, um, that will continue on the register. <clears throat> so if you are go, so th that means that the, uh, the eventual amalgamated company as the result of this amalgamation will continue on with this registration number. And you'll select the type of amalgamation, long or short. Um, last time we last time we did a short form merger. So today I will perform the long-term amalgamation, long form of amalgamation. You would upload all of the required fields. And as indicated here, you can enter an effective date and time for this amalgamation. This will be a future, this will be um, a future date. If you do not enter a future, if you do not enter a date in that field, then you would then it will be registered as of the date of submission. And down here you would out, add the amount add the amalgamating the other companies involved in the amalgamation. And you would upload the required documents for that at, in the respect of that company. If there are any other, if, there, if there's anything else uh, in relation to this, to, in relation to this amalgamation that you think the registrar of company should know, you can actually upload additional documents here that will not become filed part of the filing. As stated over here, <clears throat> in order to in order to complete this application, you would have to go through each field. Uh, once once the field is completed, you, you you'll get a green tick. If the field is not completed, then <clears throat> You would have to, you would have a exclamation mark, which you will have to come back to and ensure that that is filled in. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. As a result, as a part of the amalgamation, you can you can you can decide whether you want to change the company name. <clears throat> if you wish to continue on with this company name, you'll select no. If you select here for yes, you would have to select one of the um, one of the names of the continuing co of the amalgamated company, or you can enter in a new company name. You put in the business activity category. If that has changed, if not, it would if not, it will continue on as the um, what was originally put in at the time of registration or at the time of update profile service. You can use my organizational address to immediately fill up this field if you if you are going to be the registered office of this new amalgamated company. <clears throat> okay, and in this instance, this is um, if the if they are not if the objects for which the company is formed and incorporated are unrestricted only, you select yes. If no, or if you require additional fields to be uh, as an additional um, upload to be put onto here. This is where you can indicate as per as per the attached schedule for for, for long objects that, that do not fit into here. Or additionally, you can just type in the objects here if it's if if it fits into the category description.
now with um with an amalgamation where they're with is with a long form amalgamation where they're issuing out with where they're modifying the um memorandum of association you can actually add in subscribers because and the number of shares to be subscribed to them. As indicated before, if you if you forget to fill in any of the fields, it would always um, notify the system will notify you and direct you to exactly what must be um, what must be put in. Uh, as you see, once you hit save and continue, green tick, it shows that the um, <clears throat> shows that, that field has been completed. Now, as far as the um, share, share capital, if that needs to be modified at this time for the new amalgamated company, then you can edit it here. Um, it will bring up the share capital of the, the entity that you are coming in, in uh, under the context of which you are coming into. That's what, that's what will be displayed here. So once you have, re once you have got down to the last tab, <clears throat> You can actually review all of your review all of the um, items that you put in, and as long as everything is complete, you can either actually save the application to be submitted at a later time, or you can submit it. Now, at this time, you'll be able to review all of the fees, and be able to make your um, payment. Now, as, as indicated previously, at this time, the only, the only payment option is through our debit accounts. Um, the debit accounts should be, should be topped up be prior to the application being, being submitted because um, actually you cannot submit your application unless you have the required fees inside of your debit account. And those are topped up. Um, I went through those in webinar one and if I, if I have time to, I will go, I will go back over this to make sure that everyone's, everyone understands it today, or additionally, I will um, include that in the next webinar. So once you have hit app, once you've sent it in for review, um, an internal member of staff will actually review the application. Um, while I'm waiting for that application to be reviewed, it would actually show up in your, as you see, it will show up in your work in progress. And then once it's, once, it's review, once it's reviewed and approved, it will show up in your completed folder and you will receive emails the entire way, way through. You'll receive an email upon, um, <clears throat> upon, uh, upon submission you will and then you will receive another email upon um, completion. While we're waiting for that, I just wanted to go over the landing page. So um, <clears throat> as the system is now live, you'll be able to review, review the actual landing page for, the, for, the, um, for our new company register. And this, this has specific information in here. In here. Um, basically for the companies and partnership register, it allows people registered users to submit filings, make payments and maintain active records all in one location. <clears throat> There are certain services that will be on that will be unveiled in a future release. We are currently in phase one. Um, we also have phase two and phase three coming later on this year. We will we, we, we releasing further um, services. At this time, LLC services, discontinuances, deregistration and maintenance of SACs, re-registrations conversions, and although not, although not indicated here, sanction requests will be, will, are still to be, to be submitted in the, old, in the old way. So that's via email to ROC daily applications. And also liquidation filings. Liquidation, all liquidation filings are submitted outside the online register. 
So those are all sent to ROC liquidations. And these also, it, we also have additional links on here. <clears throat> um, this will take you to our government page, which contains additional information and also holds the forms, such as the authorization forms, um, a link to Bermuda Laws Online, the instructional videos where I've been posting up the previous webinar videos that you can go and uh, go and watch. And we will also be host putting on additional videos in for, um, for additional services. And of course, um, the documents that relate to the Economic Substance Act. Okay, so my application should be approved by now. <clears throat> As you can see, it is now in my completed folder. And it shows with you um, that has been that has been completed. And if we go into the actual companies, you actually be able to see under the filing history the actual <clears throat> the filing that gets placed against the file. as well as the certificate of registration. And that would also be sent out to the person to the person that submitted the application. Okay, at this time, I'm gonna ask Maria to join me for a second. So we can try and see if we can answer some email, some questions for about five minutes, and then we can get into the next service. Okay, thanks, George. Um, we do have quite a number of questions, not necessarily to do with just amalgamations, but we'll just go through a few of them. Um, in the directors section, should we be adding alternate directors as well? There does not appear to be any way to distinguish between directors and alternate directors. <clears throat> that is also that has also been um, identified by us, and we will be um, working with our developers to to go on to get that more clarified to get the clarification up as far as um, distinguishing between alternate directors and directors. As far as the, as far as what directors should be put there for now, the directors that are required under Section ninety two B are as per the definition in the Companies Act which includes alternate directors or any person acting in capacity as a director by whatever name. So those, that's who should be filed in there. Okay, referring to the Memorandum of Association, it does not appear that we are required to upload the traditional MOA. What shows on the website when reviewed does not look anything uh, that can be used as a legal document. How do we address this when clients require a copy of the MOA? Same okay. for Form 13. Um, the, the, the Memorandum of Association that's put against the filing history is now is what the current Memorandum of Association is. Um, it gets, you can print it off. It contains all the same information as per the previous, as per the previous um, Memorandum of Association. The only thing is the way how it's verified, the signatures is verified by, um, by electronic means now. And that is, that is done through, through the um, through the authorization form, the second page. Um, it's noted that a number of redomiciled and or liquidated companies are listed on the system for verification. Do these need to be verified? Um, <clears throat> no, those, um, for those for non-active companies, Those ones do not need to be, obviously, because nobody's going to be maintaining them. So the, the update profile service is, is set up to, um, to require, to, to be able to access filings, to, to be able to access the ability to make filings. So no, those do not need to be done. And actually, this is, that is the part, that is a portion of, um, for data migration, where we migrated all of the, for all of the previous register, um, I believe all of them were set 
to the update profile service, but um, we will work with our developers to ensure that searches can be maintained, that, that searches can be done, conducted on this. Okay. Where a company has two or more classes of shares, what document specifically is the registrar wishing for us to upload? Uh, I.e. resolutions, re share register, something else. Um, you can just upload a, upload a document that um, that that displays the, the different levels of the different classes of shares. Yeah, you do not have to upload any resolutions in that DOE. The system mentions that you can assign a work in progress to yourself, but this is impossible when uploading initial data. You can only submit and not save for review. Can this be rectified in future updates? Um, well, the update profile service is a one-time is a one-time field, so um, that was not set to be saved and be able to come back later. Um, <clears throat> the the goal is that we get this update profile service out of the way during this like immediately as soon as possible, and then we don't have to do this pro pro this service again. This was a one-time one-time um, one-time filing. Okay, when searching an entity, the system does not provide the results of the search criteria. A total list of names with all the names typed in the search field is provided. Is the registrar aware of this? I'm not, which, which question is this? When searching an entity, the system does not provide the results of the search criteria. A total list of names with all the names typed in the search field is provided. Is the registrar aware of this? Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure what you're referring to, so yeah, you might either. take a screenshot and actually email it to us, yep. and we can look into it then. Yeah, that's um. <clears throat> yeah, we can um deal with that afterwards. Uh, let's deal with what. Let's do one more. I'll take. Yep, we'll do one more question. Mm -hmm. For an amalgamation, since both entities are amalgamating and continuing as one, which company do you choose as the continuing company? Um, that would be up to that would be up to the um, to the applicant. Um, previously, what they would do is because of course we always we we have always continued on that amalgamating company from the context of one entity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in those cases, there will be one registration number that it continues on as. So whichever one that they have that that has been decided, that's the one that they would that that's the one that they would use. It's the same. It's the same process as how we have been doing them manually. Okay, so let's just do, uh, do you want to do one more and then you uh, can Yeah, let's just do one more. Okay. Uh, note that the above is different from a merger. Yep. Meaning yep. Amalgamation, where there is one which survives. So yes, so that, that yep. that's clear. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. So next we are going to go into registering as a SAC company. As always, like I said, the the easiest the you, you um the system is designed to be very intuitive. That's why we have the options that are available lead you lead you into where you need to go, and everything is done from the context of the entity. <clears throat> so from here, you will do services search search entities. This will help you how you find all of, all entities on our register. Here, manage entity. And under maintain, uh, under maintain entity, there are many different options that you can select. We're gonna go for apply for, re to, for registration to operate segregated accounts. <clears throat> so from here, you have um, certain inf information um, laid out already. This information cannot be changed at this time. Um, you'll select that field that directors of companies have read the provisions of section 16 of the, of the Segregated Account Companies Act 2000. <clears throat> you would have to fill in the field for the provisions made to account for segregated account.
you indicated the number of account, number of segregated accounts that the company wishes to be registered with um, as as and of course you can change this well, you must add a SAC representative and that can be an individual or a company. And if, if it's if it's an, an, an individual, you have to upload the um, CV of that individual. Um, if you indicate that if the company conducted business prior to his registration, you would have to upload additional doc, uh, additional information pursuant to different sections of the um, Segregated Account Companies Act. If uh, sections 26 direction if applicable, is applicable, you'll be able to upload um, upload this, this here <clears throat> and any other documents that you think the that, that will be pertinent to this application for the consideration of the registrar. As indicated previously, you can either save for later or submit it at that time. <clears throat> now the fee will be, the fee is calculated based upon the amount of segregated accounts that you set up as. Put it out through your account. Hit continue, and that that application then gets sent to the uh, sent to the um, to the registrar companies for review. As you know, with segregated accounts, currently um, they also require BMAs. BMAs, um, no objection for regulated entities, <clears throat> as well as the minister's minister's consent. So that would all be that 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 would all be processed outside of the system. And then once we have received all of the documentation that we need. Um, that all of the all of the outside approvals that will be approved on the system. Okay, well, I'm just waiting for the um, <clears throat> while we're waiting for the for the application to be approved. I just wanted to go over. So as, as, as I stated before, um, in order to utilize the system, you must be a registered and logged in user. Now we've had some questions concerning about um, users as far as their, where they gain authority over the entity. So as you can see, I am currently registered, I am currently logged in under my user account that is linked to this organization. You can actually go into the system as an individual or under your organization. If I am going in as my individual, as an individual, I will not have access to this organization's use to this organization's entities or their debit accounts. The debit account is only is only utilized through um, at once you're logged in under the organize under your organizational profile. So if I was to go in under my individual, as you can see, there are no accounts here. But if I am in, and but you can get your own separate accounts for your own individual um, users. And that'll be done through the same way. You will send an email to the um, to ROC accounts at gov.bm, indicating what your what your um, your username or your organization name, and indicating that you um, that you require a debit account. Debit accounts are required for any searches, compliance requests, any other filings, and except for ones that, that do not require a fee, such as economic substance declarations. <clears throat> okay, so the next one, we the next service we are going to go through, um, I'm going to go through registering a charge against a foreign entity. So under services, and under here, we have foreign corporation charges and search for foreign corporations. <clears throat> now, as stated previously, the system is designed to be done from the context of an entity. So 
for ant for section 61s those are registered those are registered against foreign corporations foreign corporations do not exist in bermuda so there is no entity to place it against that is why you first initially have to do a search for a foreign corporation now if there are any foreign if there are um, if the foreign corporation has previously registered a charge against it or um or if it's already registered a charge against it it will be in the search field so you can search for that entity you will type in the name of that entity and it will come up now if now if no results are found for the current criteria then you will be able to create a foreign corporation to register that charge against and by creating a foreign corporation i just mean we are creating the record to hold that to hold that charge against this does not create a new entity a new entity um, this is not a way to register an entity you cannot register a permit company this way just to clarify <clears throat> okay now as you see this one has a few more additional fields than um than the normal registration because we have to indicate we have to put in additional information for the foreign corporation Now the foreign corporation does not does not apply by the normal um, registrar company's name name conventions because of course if the company the company can be the um, for instance the suffix for in, for foreign corporations can be different in other jurisdictions. And just to uh, just to better better identify the just to better by, better identify the foreign corporation in the foreign jurisdiction, <clears throat> you can enter in the registration number in that foreign jurisdiction, and that is optional. Now, other than that, we um, <clears throat> you can indicate whether you, who who you are filing the charge on behalf of, and also is there a related Bermudian entity. In that case, you would select it and you would actually you would actually um, locate that and that would pick up the Bermudian entity and you would be able to um, register the chart to link the charge to that one as well. Now that would uh, that does not place it against that entity. It, it is still placed against the foreign the foreign corporation. After entering the date of the instrument, and upload the um, upload the instrument, um, and here it says the original instrument. Um, we will be changing that. Uh, we, we we will still accept the pre from um, certified copies as we have in the past. Um, the currency that is the currency for the charge. Um, I should put that for Canadian, right? This is in Canada. And the amount due owing, as I as I indicated previously um, at the beginning, if it is over a million, you can put in a million and one. Right when I up zeros, yeah. And then add the person, the mor the mortgages or persons entitled to the charge. You can put in an individual or other. That would be, um, you could add in your organization or another bank. Now, once you hit submit, of course, the usual payment payment fields. Uh, 
and the application has been submitted. As always, um, whatever you have outstanding, it goes into your um, goes into your work in progress view. This is also where where any applications that you are <clears throat> that you have come, that you have started, you can you can access them here. So in this instance, I have I have started those applications and put them into the um, put them into I've reached the payment stage, but I have not paid for them. So I can also go back. To, I always I can go back at this at this stage and um, finalize the application, or I can discard it. Now, <clears throat> now, as you see, once once that has been once that has been approved and placed on the register. The filing become the the foreign corporation becomes available. So now we have an entity to actually go in and see that filing that that filing against. So the uh, obviously since this we specifically put out this foreign corporation is not registered in Bermuda. The charge is registered in Bermuda. Uh, so from here, you can actually go to touch free charges. Okay, that search sort of came up, but I'll look into that one. But once you once you've actually gone through and do, done the search, one, once you've located the charge, you'll be able to see the filing, the the filing that's actually placed against that one. <clears throat> Alrighty, let's um let's do another questions and answers for like about for a couple of minutes, and I can go into the final services that we that we're going to do for today. Hi George, this is Amy Mullen. Um, with Foster Moore. And I just wanted to, as we go into these questions, some people have been commenting that the landing page was not what, they're not seeing what you're seeing um, when you were logged out and in the landing page. And it looks like some people may have an older session still open. Um, <clears throat> and so they would need to close their session and go to the new, it, although the URL is the same, they would need to um, open a new session. We, so I just wanted to point that out um, before Maria went over any questions. All right, thank you very much. Amy. I think it's causing a little bit of confusion. So, th so that means they've had the session open since before the launch? It seems that way. So when you look at your URL, um, and although you have a test site with the UAT2 on it, everything after the .com mm -hmm. is associated with the current session. And if you take all of that out and then hit enter, it's really just the UAT BM Rock link. Um, it'll create a new session. And so I'm not sure if people maybe have it saved as a favorite and have that session or if they their computers were never shut down or the with the it's more than likely internet that piece was it. never closed yeah and so they're in an old session um so if they just take out everything after the dot com or just go from so the, the best way to do site. about it would be to do this so if you just take it back all the way back out to dot com and press yep. enter it will refresh the session for you. yep and it should then show um they should then see what, what you're seeing. Got you covered. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry to interrupt, Maria. No, nope. you can interrupt anytime. You always have always have pertinent information for us. Yeah, no, that's fine, Amy. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, is it mandatory to complete shares issued under authorized share capital? Um, as far as the as far as the update profile service. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that's I'm assuming that's what they're related to. Yeah. If they have not if if there are no series issues, then you then you don't have to enter it. 
Can you please advise how 2021 AGF and penalties should be paid? Um, if you have not paid your annual, your annual government fee at this time, you should pay it the same way how it was done previously. Um, as you know, we're, we're currently transitioning. We're in our transition period. Um, this, this, the new system is designed to, is not designed to have outstanding fees against it. So right now we have to bring it, bring everything over as fresh. So the next fees that, that are due in our system will be for 2022. But for any outstanding ones, we still have access to our old system where we'll be cleaning up those records. So and basically the 2021 annual government fees are the last things that were, um, that last fees that were reported in our old system. So those ones will still be processed the same way. Um, you'll send in, um, you'll send your declaration to ROC, de ROC um, declarations and you will send the spreadsheet with the payment, with the wire payment information to ROC accounts at gov.va. Okay, uh, we've received a request um, to see if you can show an example of a section 61 entity already with a previous charge. I can add that to our next one as, um, and actually you guys, and actually our next webinar, we're basically doing by viewer's choice um, and whatever other applications that we can get to. So I can actually add that one to our, um, to our other, our next webinar. Okay. Uh, we've got a question here regarding payments and how the ROC is going to receive payments and how we, how we will be making payments for applications. Our organization does not have an existing account on the old system. We need help in understanding whether all of our companies must have an, a debit account and how we set up a debit account with the ROC. We would appreciate having a phone conversation to get this sorted out. Okay, it's, very, it's, it's a pretty simple process. Once you have registered your organization, you will send an email to ROC accounts with that organization name, indicating um, with the subject line, debit account required, um, and the organization name in the subject line. One of our internal members will, will, uh, will allocate an account, a debit account to your organization, right? Every entity does not need a debit account. Um, and actually you cannot set up a debit account against registered entities. You can only set up debit accounts against users and, or organizations. Now, if you have set up your organization and you have multiple users under that organization, like I told you, if the, uh, like I said, if, as you see, this is my organization and I have added all of these people to my organization. Now, each one of these people can go in under my organization and make files. Um, they will all utilize the organization's debit account. And actually, because I can do it real quick, so what, and making a payment to your debit account is, is actually very easy as well. <clears throat> so you would set, you would first of all, do a wire payment. So you do, so you go into your bank account, you do your wire payment to us. Whether you wish to do, um, the preferred method, of course, is just to do a bulk payment. But um, for some other people, if they, if they are submitting via, for specific applications, they can do it that way as well. So you would actually put in, put in your, client, um, your client reference here. Now under here, you actually have an, an additional options, um, electronic funds transfer. This is just how you would notify us that this has been done, that, that, that you have sent the wire already. And the issue date. Now, once you have done that, that is how you notify the registrar companies that you have made a wire payment to us. Now, our internal staff will go in and um, we, we will review that application. We will, uh, we will locate the, um, the wire payment. In, once it has reached our accounts, we will approve it and that money will be available for your um, will be available for use. Okay, what individuals are authorized to have individual accounts? Uh, the concern being how are they linked to the company and ensuring nobody has access who should not? 
Which question is that? Sorry. This is in reference to um, the option of having an individual account or an organization account on the system. Mm -hmm. And the uh, question is, right. so what individuals are authorized to have individual accounts? And their concern is how do you, um, how are they linked to the company and how do you ensure that nobody has access who shouldn't? Okay, your account is your organizational account is your is your responsibility. The only people that can add people to this organizational account are the admin users. And that is usually the person that sets up the account or and anybody that they have that they have advised is an ad, is an admin user. So nobody can you nobody can hijack your organization. All of the people here have been added by me as the administrator for this for this organization. And the only other person that can add people would be anybody else that I have added as an administrator. So in, so in other words, the other people where administrator says no, cannot add people to this account. Now, um, running it as running it as, as a full on organization, if you, if you have, um, if you have staff members that you have added onto here and those staff members leave, you will be responsible for removing them from this, from this organization. All righty. Um, okay. okay, let's get, let's, um, I'm just looking at the time. Let's get into um, additional services. I believe someone was, uh, one of the ones that we had requested previously was um, the satisfaction of a charge. So, So as you can see, this chart, this, this was actually the chart I registered in last week's webinar. You can go in and view the charge. Um, as you see, you have the original documents. <clears throat> and then down here, you can actually make corrections to the particulars. You can change the person's entitled to the charge, or you can register a release of satisfaction of the charge. Um, first, you have to indicate whether it's fully satisfied or partially the effective date of that, of the satisfaction and upload the instrument of satisfaction. Now, all this, now, the only thing that you should be uploading here is the, um, is the documents, the release documents. So that's usually documents from the, from the entity, from, sorry, from such as the bank saying that the obligations under that charge have been, have been released. Once you go through um, the usual payment payment screen, and as usual, it goes into your um, review status, and then once it is completed, it will go into um, the completed folder. Uh, while we're waiting for that, do you want to ask? Some, do you want to go and do another question real quick, Maria? While we're waiting for that application to be approved. Sure, no problem. Um, can an amalgamation filing be backdated on the system? Um, I believe it. I, be, I believe it can. I have just have to check with. I have to double check the um stacks on that. One. Uh, once the ROC validates a company, how long does it take to be accessible to request searches, etc.? Um, I'm assuming that means once once we have approved the update profile service, it, it I'm becomes, assuming that, yes. becomes available immediately. Uh, I have a scenario where I am corporate administrator, but I am not allowed to handle financial information for some companies. Okay. Um, That's probably something you need to deal with in-house. Uh, yeah. The, um, just, just, to, just to clarify the authorization process. Um, yeah, those ones, like I said, you're, you're receiving authorization to make filings on behalf of the company. So that, so all, all um, filings that are required by the various pieces of legislation that the registrar companies, that, that the registrar companies administers, those, that's what you're receiving access to on here. Um, we don't have 
we don't we don't record um, financial information. So um, yeah, that's not um, that's not something that we deal with, other than share capital. Like that's the only that's the that's as financially that accessible that we get. <laughs> George, is this question with regard to uh, economic substance declarations? Um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure. It doesn't really um, expand on that. Now now as far as economic substance declaration, that's um. Yeah, if they're not authorized to do that, they can grant it. Once you have received authority, you can grant authority to another party. And that is actually done through. From here. So as so for this company, I have authorization to make filings on this behalf, on the on the entities we have. I can grant authority to another to another party that is that is also authorized for for instance to make to make um to make economic substance declarations. Okay, let's just go now. That application I sent it into the registrar of companies. They reviewed it, and now we go in. As you see, if you just do a search for all charges, it's not going to come up. You have to include. You have to tick this one to include completely satisfied. And now it shows you that the charge status is fully satisfied. Um, the doc, the, the and um, it shows you what the what the registration date is and what the release date is. Okay, so that was that. That's the majority of our applications. Let's see. I wanted to. Uh, I will go through one more today. I'm gonna do a change of name. <clears throat> um, first of all, you go to services. Um, remember, for change of names, you have to first reserve the name. Um, you select whether we, we reserve for a new entity, change the name of the existing entity, or change the name and conversion of entity type. Now, if we have to do a change of name on the existing entity, we have to select the field here. So once you do a search, you'll be able to bring up all of the, um, now that'll be all the entities that you have, or, that you already have authorization of, over. Validate maybe. Um, you'll select any of the appropriate fields. Um, if the if it has initials in there, if if there are any abbreviations in its name, so if, in, in other words, if I were to put OS nine limited, um, you will be able to indicate inside of here whether or not the whether or not those initials represent anything. And also, if the name request is similar to the existing name of company or partnership already on the register, state the names and affiliation in, in this text. Okay, and as stated, that thing goes in for internal review. Um, now. The landing page I showed you in the first place was the was the informational page before you were actually logged in and logged in a registered logged in user. <clears throat> this is the welcome page that you have once you are logged in, and it just um, you still have all the helpful links um, and a, a few a little bit more additional text. Um, Okay, so now it's been approved. So now you'll go into the context of that entity that you just um, reserved the new name for. Now, as you see, the, the name that you that you reserved in the context of this entity is the only one that's available for this one. You can in, you you can indicate here. If the entity has a secondary name, if so, you would have to put the secondary name in here in that foreign um, in that foreign language. Upload the um, upload the certificate of translation. 
Um, you would also have to upload the certified copy of the resolution shows, um, showing that change of name. And for this part, you can actually enter in an effective date and time for the change of name. This is if you need that change of name to take effect at a certain, at a certain date and time. And that one is only a future date. You cannot backdate that. If you, if you do not enter in an effective date and time, then, you, then that will be effective as of the date of submission. Okay, once you go through, you pay your pay the fee. And that application goes in for approval. And once it's, once it has been reviewed and approved, um, then you will also receive you will number one receive an um you'll receive a no email notification as well as the certificate and the filing will be placed against the company file. As you can see, it's not been, it's not been approved yet. So it will still come up under out of reserve under the old name. Like I said, just waiting for that one to be approved. Um, you want to go through a quick question while we're while we're waiting, Gloria? Sure. Um, I've actually got a couple of economic substance um, questions here. I'm not sure if uh, Anne could probably answer um, these. Uh, the first one is: If an organization wants to allow an external party to file and economic substance declaration, do they need to add them as authorized agent or authorized organization agent? What is the difference? Uh, I believe you would, I believe it'd be an authorized agent. Um, uh, a, a authorized organization agent is somebody who belongs to the CSP. Am I correct, George? Yes, that would be correct. So the, for the organization, yeah. Is somebody is somebody from that organized it's the organization if you he want to add somebody who's not in that organization they would be an authorized organized authorized authorized agent not an authorized organization agent well you can because because you can as as an organization that has authority over an entity i can actually change i can actually give that um grant authority to an additional organization or an additional part or a person you know what i mean so that's the difference between those two. Okay, so it's up to you, really, how you'd like to. Exactly, name it's, up to the, it's up to the entity how they wish to maintain the how they wish to maintain the records, how they wish who they wish to make filings. That is that is entirely up to the entity. Yeah. <clears throat> All righty. So now, as you see, um, the name has changed. And the name has changed one, as soon as as soon as it's been approved by um, by the registrar companies. The name has been changed, and you would also. Be able to see here on the previous names, you can see the date. Um, obviously, this started at registration, and then the end date for that date for that name, and also the current name. You also be able to see inside the filing history notification of the change of name, which just which basically just shows that the name was changed from that to that, and also the certificate of change of name, which is this, which is um, produced by the system. It shows the old name and the new name and the effective name. Okay, with that, that's all. That's that's. Um, we did not get to share capital changes today. I will go. I will include that in next week's um, in next week's webinar, and also put that out with um, with with additional with additional um, additional requests that we've been receiving, such as that existing um, section 61s, how that used, and any other pertinent matters that come up um, in between now and then. With that, let us see if we can just get to um, finalize the last bit of questions. We can, I think we have about five minutes left in this one. 
Okay, uh, May, let me see. Is there a fee for a change of name? Yes. Yes. There is, just like there is, there was previously, there, there is now. Yep, there was $190 that I, I went to and paid the fee when I, I might have, I might have been getting a little bit too quick on there. Um, as you see, the system, the system's designed for you to breeze through it um, once, once it's all, once it's all done. So I, um, I went through and paid the fee through my account for that change of name just now, for, which was $190. Uh, can you activate a feature to upload uh, memos of association for objects instead of free text as there are limited characters? Um, I think I covered that that before, but just like I said, we are, that is one of the one of the things that, I, that has already been identified. Um, current, um, we are working with our developers to um, to to get that um, to get that feature added. But as with a as with a live system, um, we cannot make immediate changes to the system. So what we are doing currently is, um, if you have if if the objects do not fit into that field, you would type in there as per attached schedule or as per schedule, and you can coordinate with the registration agent as per the portfolio listing currently, and you can actually send the send the um, the the schedule with the objects on it in an additional in a PDF to that registration agent, and then we will attach it once the application has been approved we will be able to go in and actually attach it to the memorandum association file. So it all shows up as one document. For companies incorporated prior to the new system, can you tell me how to order a tax assurance certificate on the new system? <laughs> um, tax assurance, I can actually cover those ones in the next, in the next, um, in the next webinar. But um, I believe I've had that question now. If you, if you need to, if you need to order one before that, you can just send me an email, ggautobridge at gov.bm. I have to, um, it, it slipped the top of my head right now, how to do that. <laughs> but I, I, I can walk you through it. And when will this webinar be posted or uploaded? I'm sorry. Um, as soon as I get a minute to edit it um, and clean it up and put it online. Um, I, I, I'm trying to actually get it done tonight so that this information is available for everybody. But um, that all depends on how many emails I get in relation to it. But of course, I want to keep everybody happy and get all get, get as many good questions asked. But it will be posted. It will be posted up soon. Um, I say the link is actually current is actually down here. Instructional videos. You can check back on that, and also you can. Um, it's a YouTube page, so you can actually subscribe and you can you can indicate that you wish to receive updates with that. And then as soon as it's posted up, you'll receive an update that is ready that is ready for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, you okay, um, we've got one minute left. I will read the very last question and then we'll close out the seminar. Uh, it's an economic substance uh, filing question. Um, an economic substance filing was submitted previously by CSP for an entity. Can a new CSP for that same entity be able to see what was submitted by the former CSP? Will the new existing CSP be able to submit a new substance filing? If uh, you are a new CSP authorized for that entity, yes, you, once you've provided once you've been authorized, you will be able to see whatever is in the past, has been filed in the past for that entity. Um, what was the second part of the question? That um, can you file a new CSP once you, you can't, you can't change an existing, an existing uh, declaration, but you can file the, the one for 2020. I think they were asking if the, if the, if the new CSP could file a declaration. As yes. long as you currently have authority over that entity, authority to make filings on behalf of that entity, then you can make the, then you can make those filings. That's yeah. Okay, and that's that's time. It's two fifteen, so we'll wrap it up here. Um, just to remind everybody, like George says, we have uh, our last seminar is next week Wednesday, and if you have any specific. Uh, applications that you'd like to review, go over, whatever. We're leaving it open to, you know, whatever requests that you have. So we'll just take the, the, the most requested sort of applications and build the webinar around that. 
your requests. Um, so thank you again for joining us. And I Maria, would... Maria, just let me just add one thing before for closing up. Sure. And thank you, you both, you and George. I just want um, you just to be aware that I mean, as we go through this process of implementation, we understand no implementation is smooth or perfect. And so if there's constructive feedback that you would like to give to the registrar, we are quite receptive to having that information. I mean, ultimately our objective is to get a system that works obviously well for us, but for you as well, but is also a boon to Bermuda as a jurisdiction. So we're quite keen and open and receptive to receiving any, any constructive criticism or feedback that you may have. And again, George and Maria, thank you for doing another excellent uh, webinar. Cheers. No problem, thank you. Thank you everybody, enjoy the rest of your day.